Good morning, Sweet 16. Can you believe it? Wow. We celebrate Sweet 16, and it is so, so good to be back with you, my favorite people, in my favorite place on my favorite day. It is going to be an awesome day. By the way, just a few minutes ago, as I was walking over here, I got a text from our beloved founding pastor, Dr. Rumley, and I can't read the whole thing to you because I'll break down crying. But I just want him to know, Pastor Steve, if you're watching, we love you. We are here because of you and you and Diane, your hard work. We love you. We honor you. We appreciate you. God bless you. God bless you. And and, uh, he sends his love and his greetings, as does Diane. Keep praying for them. They pray for us all the time. Pray for them. Pray for their health. And pray for their ministry down in Myrtle Beach. We love. We miss them every day. Happy Sweet 16. I want to thank you and begin by saying... God bless you, Potter's Hand, for forcing us to get away for two weeks. It was awesome. It was exactly what the doctor ordered. We didn't even know how much we needed that. But uh, we were obedient. We put the phone away. We disappeared into a black hole of fun and mindless decompressing. But I, I followed your orders. And to show you that I have proof, I have a few pictures that I want to bring to you just to show you that we did indeed get away. And there's your pastor and a few, few familiar faces you might recognize. This was the first ride we went on, the Incredible Hulk. Anybody rode this? Oh, my goodness. It is uh, aggressive, shall we say. And it's fantastic. And, but it has safety harnesses. Big shoulder thing comes down. But the thing I really love is it has a seat belt that comes between your legs and attaches to the bottom of the harness so that should the harness fail, which in my mind, I'm safety pup, I'm counting the ways it could fail, and I'm thinking, oh, the safety belt's going to stop us. No big deal. So I felt great, and I could relax and scream, and it was awesome. So we get off that ride, and no sooner have we feet hit the ground, and I kiss the earth, Milo looks over, and he says, Dad, that was awesome, but I want to ride that. And this is what he points to. <sighs> yes. And yeah, that was my reaction, too. The roller coaster of death. It's called the Riptide or the Rip Snort and something. It's, it, is, it is aggressive, aggressive. The only problem is it doesn't have a safety harness that comes over your shoulders, nor does it have a backup that I crave. No safety belt, no, no little man-made little strap, no, no rope, nothing. Just this little flimsy, curvy arm that comes over, and it comes over, and my was right beside me. So we get on it, and we're, we're going up. And I want you to, when you go on a roller coaster, first thing you hear is click, 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 right? Yeah. Well, not this one, my friends. Au contraire, mon frere. What happens on this is you go straight up. And I mean straight up. You are lying on your back. It's like, I'm not, this is not like hyperbole or pastorally speaking. You are literally going 90 degrees perfectly straight up. And it's in this moment that I began to question things. Not my faith, but I began to question faith in man. And how, how secure is this non-harness? And this little click, 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 click ratchet, that could fail. And I began to play tricks on my mind of how many ways this could fail. And as we get to the top of this hill of death, we almost slow down and time seems to stop. And I look out and I see all over Orlando. I think I even see Apex. <laughs> it is so far. And I'm, I'm like getting nervous. And I look over at Milo and Milo's like, Gee! he's so excited. And I see this little flimsy lap. And again, I start to panic. And I think, what have I done? I am a terrible father. I'm going to die. And then we begin to go down the hill, and my worst fears are confirmed. We go down the hill, and we're screaming at us, and then you go into a loop, and you think, okay, a loop is designed to force you back into your seat, because the gravity, full, you know, and you don't really even notice it. It's over before you know it. But I want to show you the loop that we go on. There's something horribly wrong with this picture. <laughs> Anybody, can you tell? You're on the wrong side of the loop. You're on the outside. So instead of getting G-forces pushing you into the safety of your seat, you experience negative G's, and you come out of your seat. And it was in that moment (laughs) that the Lord and I had a talk. I kid you, I'm looking at my son, and I'm putting my hand on his harness. I'm pushing down as if I could hold him in. You know, like, I'm going to do this. I'm sitting here, and I start to say, Lord, I have been a fool. First off, I repent of this ride, and I am so, so sorry that I am on this ride. But my church insisted I go on this ride, so I'm trying to be obedient and being a faithful friend of theirs. And we go, and then I said, 
<laughs> so embarrassing. I make a deal with God. You ever do that? <laughs> Said, and then I wasn't praying like, dear sweet baby Jesus, six pound, eight ounce baby. I prayed to the creator of all there is, the sustainer of all life. And I said, Heavenly Father, if you could somehow find it in your vast majesty to deliver us from this ride and let us live. When we get off this ride, I will never go on this ride again. The promise I made. I made a vow, a solemn vow on that loop. So we get off the ride, and I am so happy. And I, I'm about to, with tears, kiss the ground, and I look at my adoring son, who is having a total other reaction of, that was incredible, that was awesome. And his first word, I was like, Dad, that was awesome. Can we ride it again right now? And I put my hands on my son's shoulders, and I look into his deep blue eyes, and I say, son, I cannot, <laughs> for I have made a vow with the Lord this day, <laughs> and I will honor that vow. Now, what you choose, if you want to break your vow, Lord, you, let's, but I am going to hold to that vow. So we made it, and it was awesome, and I thank you, I thank you, I thank you guys for sending us on this death-defying trip. It was awesome. It was so, so good, and today we're going to celebrate all that God has done over the past 16 years, and the fact that I could get away and come back and talk about this. I want you to know something. Your faithfulness, your love for your pastor, for his family, is speaking volumes to so many people you don't even know. Pastors in other churches, this city, saying, man, what, what is going on over there that they would do? My, my church gave me like a stopwatch. You know, and you guys get an all expense paid trip down, to, you know, and I, we got like a pen, <laughs> you know, and so thank you. People know that, and you are setting a great example. You know, I'm not saying do it again. We'll receive it, but I'm just saying <laughs> if you want to, you need to know that uh, your love speaks loudly. And all kidding aside, thank you. Thank you. My family thanks you. We love you. I am so tickled at what God has done these past 16 years, and I can't imagine what he's going to do in the next 16. Who was here the very first day? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got, we got a smattering of those around. Once we came out of that first school, oh, we went into this uh, middle school. Here's a picture of me and Pastor Rumley. And uh, this is, why are you laughing? <laughs> we don't have to state the obvious, okay? All right. I've changed a little bit. This was a middle school cafeteria that was dark and smelly with stained ceiling tiles and aromas and, and sticky things on the floor that the FBI and CSI still has yet to identify. And notice the plastic green disc chairs with no backs. I mean, it was, we were truly suffering for Jesus. And to think where we were and all God has done, and just fast forward 16 years, and to think that here we are expanding, getting additional campuses and, and looking at things that God has done and expanding our footprint. God is granting us favor. These are dreams we had just like a year ago. And I look back, and it's happening so fast, and there's so much. We used to have overflow stacks of chairs stacked on the wall to put out when we needed it. Now, we don't even have to. We put those out, and we've left them out, and tables are getting further and further into the back, into the corners, and, and y'all are still struggling to find places. So God is challenging us for some things, and I am so excited to share some of these things. Our doors don't close at noon on Sunday, and then maybe open for a couple hours on, on a Wednesday. The community drive by and think, oh, there's that nice, big, empty building sitting unused. That's about as self-centered as I thought the church was. And then they confirm their suspicions, and they go on. Our doors are open seven days a week, and we are ministering to people, and God is giving us favor into the community like we've never seen before. Seven days a week, sometimes eight in the morning, I'll come by, and the parking lot will be packed. Or a Saturday at 10 p.m., it'll be packed. Like last night, I mean, it was incredible. We had Chris August here, and, and, and to see God being exalted, and we started not one, but two preschools are meeting here during the week. Kappa, the Carolina Academy of Performing Arts, is meeting here. These are people who don't necessarily come to church. Refit. People, 50 people in here sweating and singing. Gone are the days when a church could put out a little shingle and say, y'all come. See, 100 years ago, the church apparently gave the message to the world, you got to be like us before you can join us and effective in meeting people to 40%. Now down to 28% affect your thing. We'll just still do ours. And there's this chasm. And you can see the divide. You see it all over the country where it's like a different planet sometimes. I got a text 
just today, 6.30 this morning, I got a text and I asked permission to show it to you and your church on the sweet 16th anniversary of Potter's Hand Bible Church. You and your family have sacrificed and have carried the baton of grace well in Apex, my brother. Apex is truly a better place thanks to you and so many others who continue to give themselves away to be used by God so that others can live in peace. Your love, Potter's Hand, is pure. Thank you. Thank you for running the race. Are you hearing this? Thank you for running the race to plant and sustain the Potter's Hand for 16 years. Know that I am cheering you on. I am praying for you for another 16 plus years. Love you. Love you all. God bless you. God bless the potter's hand. Have a joyous day celebrating. Sincerely, Captain Jacques Gilbert, Apex Police Department. Unsolicited. Not even a member of our church. Sending that at 6.30 this morning. I can't even tell you how many others I've gotten because you are making a difference. Never forget that. I want to encourage you. If you hear nothing else today, these 16 years, phenomenal. Wait till you see what God has next for us. I can't wait to see. This is going to be an incredible year. And what we see coming, now more than ever, the world needs the church. Trust me. Now more than ever, the world needs to know love and forgiveness and peace and purpose. It only comes from knowing God. only comes from studying his word. only comes from being with a community called the church. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to open your Bibles to Psalm 95 and hold your place there. If you've got a digital app and you're following along, I'm going to read from the New King James today, the NKJV. And for those who are at home, God bless you. I know so many people have the flu bug going around. We're praying for you. Hope you feel better. can come back and join us. We're going to read from the New King James, Psalm 95. I want to set the table here before we read it of what's happening. And here's the context of what we're about to read. Let me ask you a weird question. How many of you like to bowl? Anybody? Anybody good at it? Like, I bowl like a 90. Is that good? Is that, is that, I break triple digits every now and then, but I, I don't know if the top score you can get is like 120, but I've gotten like 108 before. There is a phenomenon that has happened, and there is a story written in a book called Bowling Alone, and it's written by Dr. Putnam. He's a Harvard professor. Y'all, this book was a landmark. Sociologists all over the world freaked out with the research. He researched communities and networks all over the country. But he said the thing that blew his mind the most was what he discovered in a bowling alley. And not just one bowling alley, not just Buffalo Lanes over here, but bowling alleys across America. In fact, it was so powerful, that's why he called this bowling alone. And he said he discovered more people were bowling than ever before over the last 15 years, but participation in bowling leagues was greatly decreasing. This is over the same period. There were more bowlers but fewer people bowling together. And here's the truth grenade that he inadvertently stumbled on. Instead of bowling in community, people were bowling alone. Oh, church, I'm going somewhere with this. I'll give you a hint. This isn't just about bowling leagues. This is something we see happening everywhere. This Dr. Putnam warned us that this move toward isolation will ultimately hurt the community. It will ultimately hurt people. And here's the creepy part, almost the part that's prophetical. He wrote this in the year 2000, 18 and a half years ago. He wrote this. This is, this is before this thing. This is before Netflix binges. This is before all this. It's only gotten easier. This is before you would go out to eat and you would see booths packed with people staring at their phones, right? We just had Valentine's Day. And I promise you, everybody could identify with this. Honey, oh, it's Valentine's Day. Let's go somewhere romantic and stare at our phones. Because this is the new normal. I could put picture and picture and meme after meme showing this. This is so crazy. This is before Netflix binging was, was common in our culture. I mean, I kid you not, just last week, our two-year-old daughter, Mercy, <laughs> which ap aptly named Mercy, <laughs> She was watching, he was on the sofa, and the kids were there, and they, were watch, they liked to watch a show called The Flash. Apparently, it's that red superhero dude that runs really fast. And they were watching it, and Mercy says, no, I want to watch my show. Boss, baby. Boss, baby. She says, baby. 
And Mercy and Marin's like, oh, okay, you want to watch that? Fine. And they just go right over to the flash because they don't think she knows what's going on. And she stood up. She goes, no. I will never watch that fast guy. <laughs> Boss baby. She's two. And she understands Netflix binging. And this is what's happened. This is what is so creepy about the decline of community. It's only gotten easier for us to move in isolation. Think about it. Netflix makes it so hard for you to stop watching. You are already opted in. All you got to do is just sit back and relax. Even my DVR does it. You got five very quick seconds to opt out. Or it's going, you know, I'm like, I can't. I got to go to the bathroom. Well, maybe I could stay. The next thing I know, it's like seven days later. And we're watching this, and it is so easy for us. If you're an introvert, you panic if you hear anybody even walking by your house. Right? You know what I'm talking about. This is perfect. This cap, see if you identify with this. Today I waited inside my apartment because I could hear my neighbor unlocking her door, and I didn't want to make small talk. I don't want to go out. Oh, I'll just come back later. Some of you can identify with this because we have pulled back. Half of us don't even know our neighbors. I didn't even know I had neighbors, that kind of thing. And it's like... We used to know everything that was going on in everybody's house. You used to, how you doing, Mr. Kapersky? And you'd go say hi and take my kids for a day or two. And no. Can you imagine? <laughs> Pastor Bill and I, we talked about this. He used to run the bus ministry at church, 3,000 people. And he would show up, truth, he would show up in the bus and go talk to people. Go, hey, I noticed you got some kids in your front yard. How about they hop on the bus and we'll bring them back in about four or five hours. We're going to take them to church. If you tried that today, you would be put in jail. They'd be like, what's that? Like, oh, come on. I know you don't know me, but hop on the bus, little boy. Hop on the bus, little girl. We're going to church. It's not only no, <laughs> goodness no. You're not. Can you imagine? Times have so changed. Authentic community is no longer the norm. It's abnormal if you have a community of believers. And we're abnormal to so many people. And I hope we're abnormal because of our love. Because they'll know we're Christians by our love. They'll know we are different. So if it can happen in this isolation trend in communities like bowling alleys and out there, what happens when it happens to the church? Can it happen here? If people can bowl alone, can you do church alone? What does scripture say about it? We just throw our hands up and say, well, <laughs> that's just the culture, you know? We had a good run for a couple thousand years, but, you know... <laughs> Nobody's interested in living a righteous and moral life and love and forgiveness and things like that and holy standard. Oh, well, <laughs> let's watch some more. Or is there a biblical standard that we're supposed to hold up? Let's see what Psalm 95 says. Check it out, verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Count how many times it says us, by the way. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. We just did that. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Isn't that good? Did you catch how many us and we and how much you never heard the word I or me or isolation or being alone on an island? Now, when I read this and I study, I love to get different translations, see if I can glean a hidden gem. And the message this week is always good. So let's read it together and check out the difference here. Come, let's shout praises to God. Let's raise the roof woo, woo, for the rock who saved. I love it. It's like I'm like in the 90s again. This is so, so cool. Let's march into his presence singing praises, lifting the rafters with our hymns. And why? Because God is the best. He's the high king over all the God. I love this. In one hand, he holds the deep caves and the caverns. And in the other hand, he grasps the high mountains. He made the ocean. Oh, he owns it. His hands sculpted earth. So come. Let's worship. Bow before him. On your knees before God who made us. Oh, yes, he's our God, and we are the people he pastures, the flock he feeds. Wow, that's awesome. 
so passionate about God's word and what he says here, because right here we see something so profound. It is a glittering jewel right there if you're willing to accept it. And so many people aren't, but I hope we are as the church, as the bride of Christ. And that is this Old Testament truth. God's people were commanded to worship in community. Boom. It was a command. Notice the plural of all those verses. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before him. There's no lone rangers here. There's no just me. I'm going to go do it for myself. The word here in Greek that for church used in scripture is ekklesia. And it is a powerful word that means the called out ones. The called out ones. In this context, it literally means a called out gathering. That's you. And notice that there's no singular user. There's an S there. It's not the called out one. <laughs> Party of one. Church. It's the called out ones. You come. It's plural. Church is never mentioned in an audience of one. It is a gathering, a called out body of believers who are on mission together. Loving God and loving people. And then serving God and serving people. That is our mission. How are you doing with that? Can you take it or leave it? Are you kind of like, eh? Are you sending a signal loud and clear to your kids? Hey, community with believers and encouragement. It's important, son, unless there's something better. Because <laughs> they see that. They see our example. The example we show up to our parents. It goes both ways. What's truly important? This community, it is a command. But see, in America, we're so blessed. We, we're almost consumers of church. Can be honest? Is that right? It's awful quiet in here. <laughs> we consume everything. I'm not, I'm not, I can't get it up. Oh, I want this, this. And in this Sunday, man, we could pick the church down to the color of hair or lack thereof you want of your preacher or of people you want in your small groups. Just what you name it. It is a buffet. Pick and choose. You can have what you want, when you want it, where you want it, the way you want it, how close you want it to your building. I mean, it is amazing. But here's the, here's the warning. Resist the urge to make consumption the goal because community on mission, that is our goal. And there is a profound warning here. To not get caught up in consuming and not just come up, even, it's not even about attendance, it's about engagement and believing and going on the mission and we have got to take the gospel where it is. I love technology. I think it's awesome. We have, we have an online campus that meets every single week. In fact, Tion just sent me the stats this week and they blew my mind. Are you ready for this? Check this out. This is just their YouTube channel alone. Right here, we see plus 21 subscribers just last month alone. Plus 21 people logging in and being a part of our online campus. Up 686 views for just last month watching 6,201 minutes watched of you guys worshiping Yahweh and hearing God's word. 6,000 minutes. Y'all, I don't know how many hours it is, but that feels like the Lord of the Rings trilogy happening right there. That is a big deal. That is a lot going on. And just like early believers embraced the printing press, you know, hundreds of years ago and thought it was revolutionary. Or just like Billy Graham embraced television and radio and changed the world. So we have to remember the tools of our days and produce content to go where they are. Because let's be honest, church, they ain't just coming on their own free will. They have to know you and trust you and be invited by you and by me. Think about that. How are you doing with that? It's your friendly neighborhood pastor. I mean, just challenge us. Remember, there's a reason the New Testament was written in Koine Greek and not Classical Greek. So you may not know that, but it wasn't written in the Classical Greek. It was written in Koine Greek, the common man's language. It was down on their level. It was on the street where people could understand it. And that's what we do. We bring it down to a level that hopefully people can understand. But I want you to know this and hear me loud and clear. As we share this message... And as we send it out, people are watching overseas, Germany, Iraq. We've got people calling in saying, hey, thank you. Thank you for this. The goal is for every single person not to consume church, not to be isolated by yourself, but to join a church body and find biblical ecclesia and koinonia fellowship. Because we need that. The Bible says that is where we need encouragement and fellowship. And we come together. And it's not just an Old Testament thing, lest you think this is some archaic thing. Look what the writer of Hebrews says in this next passage. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Thank you, Jesus. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Don't miss this next part. Let us hold tightly 
without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways, hear this, think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And then he goes on to drop the grenade. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. But let's encourage each other, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Notice the plural in this again. Let us go into his presence with sincere hearts. Let us hold tightly without wavering. Let us watch out for one another, uh uh-oh, and motivate one another, oh, how you doing with this, to love and good works, not neglecting our meeting together. All those last two verses are huge. This is such a huge warning that we are to take seriously our responsibility to love each other and to stir people up towards good works. How are you doing with that? Because this week, I asked myself, how am I doing with that? And frankly, I feel like such a failure so many days. I can barely minister to my family effectively, let alone 300 members. So many things I can't get to. All I think about is all the things I can't do, all the visits I can't make, all the hospitals I can't see, all those things. And I feel like a failure. The devil comes and whispers and says, you call yourself a pastor and you're pathetic. How do you feel? Because it says we're supposed to encourage each other and stir each other up to good work. Do you know what the Greek really means in verse 25 when he says, don't neglect, don't forsake? It literally means don't abandon each other. Wow, don't abandon each other. Think about that. It's like the military term, leave no man behind. On the field, your guy is laying down and he's bleeding and he's hurting and your buddy sitting next to you may be bleeding and hurting today and our job is to come beside him and pick him up. And I can't do that if I've never met you. And I can't do that if I'm not in community. And I can't do that if I've only known you from a distance. That's why it's so important for biblical koinonia and this ecclesia where we are called out together to come and link arms and say, I've got your back. But what was happening here in Hebrews, the writer says, tragically, people were deciding intentionally to not assemble with other believers. And it was tearing the church apart. In fact, Hebrews' writer goes on to say that there's a simple truth that they're missing. We are never intended to live the Christian life in isolation. Never. We were never meant to be an island. We need to persevere together. And one of the best ways to stay faithful, and I'm talking to somebody, if you are struggling with something right now, Don't fight that temptation in that battle alone. I don't know who that is. Don't fight it alone. We need each other. You are safe here. Ain't nobody got it all together here. Amen? If you're perfect, please come take over. (laughs) I will gladly sit down. I joke with Pastor Steve all the time. You ready to come back? I got your seat all warmed up, man. I will step aside in a heartbeat. But I'll do this as long as God calls me. I want to be faithful. We need this community. We need each other. Now more than ever, the world needs to see us loving each other and encouraging each other where there is no room for gossip or slander or hatred or malice. But we are one beggar telling another beggar where we found food. Come on in. The water's wine. You you are fine here. You are safe here. This is where we depend on each other. We are part of a team and we identify with each other. Does that sound good? Because we like being on a team. Just last week, this hit me right in the face. I was sitting there on Universal Islands of Adventure, and a parade came along, and it was the Minions. Oh, the Minions. There's an evil ruler that runs the Minions. Anybody know his name? Gru. Yes, the great bald-headed Gru. And as he came closer, I was watching my kids, and all these kids started lining up. There were thousands of people. They were cheering and clapping, and the Minions were going around squirting people with water guns and stuff. And they came closer, and they, I was just like, oh, wow, this is neat. Look, there's Gru. And I think we have another photo. And he gets a little bit closer, and he comes like, oh, my goodness, he's up there. And, and I'm like, he's the bad guy. And people were like, boo, boo, you know. And then something happened. Oh, I'll never forget it. Gru found me. And he locked his eyes on me. And I know it was just for me. And he looked in this next photo. You could see it. He is staring right at me. And then he did something I'll never forget. He looked at me, and he pointed at me. And he said, yes, you, same haircut. (laughs) True story, right? It's right there. I'm like, whoo, do you know what my reaction was? I kid you not. It was so embarrassing. I started dancing. I'm like, whoa, yeah, you and me, you and me. We, 
got the same, right? In a minute, we had become brothers in baldness. We had, we had bonded. Why? Because we identified with each other. In that moment, he wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't Gru. He was my brother. I love him. I just wanted to hug him. What happened? We identified with each other. We had community just like that. We were part of the same team, and that's what we have, and that is what is so special about Potter's Hand. I get to visit churches when I'm off, and I do that. I don't sit in the bed and take it easy. If I can help it, I get out and I go worship somewhere because community is important, and I want to model that for my children. And we went, we went to some great churches, but I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade Potter's Hand for nothing. We have something special. There is a koinonia fellowship here. I, I got some stats, and I wasn't sure this week if I wanted to share them with you, but it, you need to know what comes across my desk. Tom Rainer, great statistician, works for Lifeway and Southern Baptist Convention, and he released some stats just this week. And here's the sobering reality that we, as the body of Christ, need to be aware of. He said, just this year, 8,000 churches will close their doors in America. 8,000 churches are dying and will close their doors. That breaks down to 660 a month or 150 this week will close their doors. And the pace is accelerating because it is now culturally abnormal to do what you're doing today. You're taking a stand by being here. When you got in your car, your neighbors noticed you were gone. You have a silent testimony. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not is irrelevant. They see you, and they take notice. They see how we live, and they're wondering, man, what is up? And I hope that our words match our deeds. But if they don't from time to time, get back up off the horse. Let me encourage you. Go ride. We need you. The world needs the church. They need to see us. They need to see if we're having 150 congregations shut their doors every week, new church plants, just to keep pace with population, we would have to plant 38,000 churches this year alone. It ain't happening. We're barely doing half that. Think about that. We are one of the few churches in the area that is still posting a net gain year after year. One of the few. Did you know that when your church crosses over 200 people attending, you are now in the top 10% of churches in America? That's crazy. That means we are larger just with us than 90% of the churches meeting that dot the, the countryside all across America. So if you're waiting for the cavalry to come in and do our job, you are the cavalry. This is it. Look around you. We're it. We are the ones. When Jesus ascended to his father... On that hillside that day, after the resurrection, he handed the keys to us, his bride, the church, and he said, go, make disciples and baptize. He gave that commission to us. Does that sober anyone else up, or is it just me? You always think, well, somebody else got it, somebody else better equipped, somebody, no, <laughs> it's you, it's me, it's the potter's hand. This is why we do what we do. What we have here is great. It is so rare, but I tell you what, even the mega mall, giant box churches offer you everything you want. Several have dropped near us. Great people. I'm friends with the pastors. I love them. You'll never hear me say anything unkind about a brother preaching the word. But can I reveal something that even they will share? They're losing the battle. The mega church I served at, a few churches before starting the potter's hand, I walked by the desk of the senior pastor and some of the associates, and I saw the stats on his table. Do you know what they said? This is the largest church in the state of Alabama, the largest. I looked, it said, additions for the year, 652 people saved, baptized, or joined the church. 652, and I was like, man, that is awesome. I couldn't wait. I was about to clap and shout until my eyes went to the next line, and it said 670 deletions. A net loss of 20. And that was the church that was blowing and going. See, you won't hear those numbers unless somebody's being candid and open. 
in America, if we don't take our faith seriously, if we are not committed to community, we're losing this generation. I praise God we got youth sitting on the front row. A children's program, bar none. A youth program, the kids don't even want to go home. Our worship program, my goodness, it's insane. It's so, so, it gets me to the throne every single week. And a body of believers who love my family can't even go there. So what's your part in this? We're going to finish a little differently today. What is your part in this if God calls us to take a bold step? Would you be willing if God calls us to add another service, to create space for one more? Would you be willing to give up your seat and come to that earlier service, eight in the morning or nine? What if that affects your small group time? We can't add any more small groups at nine o'clock. Every room is full. If we do any more, it's just Sunday school. We might as well just call it that. Would you be willing to open up your home on a Monday night or a Tuesday night? Some do. Mike Triplett does. God bless you, brother. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to teach? What if we are called to launch a mission church further out? Would you be willing to be the campus pastor? I can't do it. Maybe God's calling someone here. Would you be willing to teach it? Would you be willing to be that first impressions coordinator to greet people and say, hey, oh, wow, man, you're homeless? Are you kidding? Come on in. How could we love you? Sit down on the front row. Would you be willing? What if God calls us to add a satellite campus? It's further out, but we need 50 people to go and plant that because just adding people isn't going to cut it anymore. You have to multiply. That's what Jesus is talking about. It's about multiplication. Go, plant, go, go. That's what the disciples did. Here's the word. Here's the thing. God bless you. You're commissioned. Go. Here's the word. Here's your mission. Go. God bless you. Go. It's not just about coming and consuming. It's about going on mission and being in community with each other. Man, that's a totally different mindset. The world needs the church. If you believe that, if you believe that we weren't meant to go this way alone because we can't, we're not meant to be an island, what is your part? So here's my challenge. Will you pray about what your part is? Because I think I wouldn't be surprised at all if you start hearing some bold vision coming from the Lord to his church in America, including his church right here in Apex. Because we got to step up. We got to move forward. Those first 16 years were awesome. The next 16 are going to blow that away. God is moving. He is doing something. In the last days, there's going to be a great falling away of people, church. Count on it. But at the same time, there is going to be an outpouring of his Holy Spirit on his remnant, on those who take his mission seriously. Ooh, I don't know about you, but I know what camp I want to be in. Who's with me? Will you step up? Here's where we're going to do something different. Speaking of stepping up, I want to share some news with you. I want to share some news and celebrate someone who has stepped up greatly over these last couple years. And this person hates I'm about to do this, but I got it. Shannon, where are you? I see you. I see you. Carlos is pointing you out. You just got ratted out by your family. Come here. Come here. Come. I won't bite. Come come here. (laughs) Shannon needs no introduction, and neither does her family. Both up generational and down generational, the roses and the camels, this is an awesome family. Right here. (laughs) Yeah, I promise. This won't hurt. She does not want me to do this, but we love Shannon, and Shannon has been an amazing part of our Potter's Hymn family, and we are so blessed to have her whole tribe, her whole family. And recently, Shannon had some tests run, and she gave me permission to share some of this, and the test results came back last week, and uh, she's got some health concerns, you know, uh, nothing insurmountable with the Lord, but she's asking for our prayers, and uh, she had some tests run. Uh, your, we learned she has diabetes on top of a lot of things she'd been going. Your sugar was 500, what was it? Five, 586. Now, if you're like me and you're not sure what that means, the higher the number is not good. It's not like a score. It's, you want it low, and that's, that's big, and She had some other numbers that came through, and she asked if she could step back for a while. And I absolutely said, no, 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 I said, yes, (laughs) yes, absolutely, you can. And uh, we want to pray for her and her family. And while she's requested to step back from a lot of things on her plate, she's going to step back from some things in church and some responsibilities because she has a generous heart, 
And frankly, she has a hard time saying no, <laughs> which is a beautiful thing about her and her whole family. Donald and Brenda have this problem too, by the way. They, they're awesome people. But we're going to help her say no, just like you helped me and my family get away when we never get away. So somebody needs to step up and help with some of the stuff that she's doing because her health is more important to us than anything. We love what she does for the church, but our loyalty to her is as a sister in Christ first and to her health and to her family. So she's going to take some steps back. She's going to focus on her health for a while. And we want to love her and we want to, we want to honor her. So I think we got a couple things. Yeah, bring this over here because you're, 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 we're not done. We're not done. All right. So Vanna White has some flowers. I grew these in our backyard over the last couple weeks. Just want you get to hold this. These are beautiful, and these are just a token. We have some balloons for you because balloons make everybody happy, and you have lots of balloons. We had several cakes we were going to give you, but we have way too many cakes and sugar, and we, that's not good for, for sugar and diabetes and things. So what we've done is we're going to have a card here, and we have a real card for you that I want you to take. You hold this, too. You got one more hand? Just put this right here. This card is for you. When you step through the line today, because we're about to eat, Priscilla's going to come up in a minute and tell us how we're going to eat. This card is still empty. I want you to sign this. We have a music stand. Jason's going to have that with a pen. And while you're waiting in line to come to the buffet, will you write her a message of encouragement and just let her know how much you love her? She's not going anywhere, okay? She's not, like, moving. There's no scandal. She hasn't run off with the church keyboard player. Nothing weird like that. This is <laughs> nothing like that. This is genuinely, we love her. And she, that was a weird thing to say, wasn't it? <laughs> I guess you always hear about that in other churches, like, oh, that pastor ran on him. Full confession, I am with the church keyboard player, just so you know. <laughs> this card will be on a music stand, okay? Come by inside. It doesn't have to be a long thing. It's not a goodbye. This is an encouragement, okay? All right, everybody hear me? Are you with it? Let her know how much you love her. Would you just give her an applause just so she can hear you? All right. Are you mad at me? I love you. I love you. All right, you can go. You can go. Sorry, I know she hates that. I know she hates that. Priscilla, if you will come up here before we pray and, and share a couple things, I want to remind you guys of a couple key things you need to know about. This Wednesday night, I'm starting a new study in James. You want to be here for this, unless you don't like being challenged. If you want to stay exactly like you are and have casual Christianity, stay home and surf Netflix. Otherwise, bring your steel-toed boots, because this is a doozy. It's going to be awesome, all right? This Wednesday night, I'm already preparing that. It is going to be fantastic. Come on out. Friday night, you cannot forget this. Our daddy-daughter, our annual dance is this weekend, and it is going to be so amazing. We've gone for six, seven years in a row. I was looking at little pictures of how Maren's grown, and soon she's going to outgrow it. And then I got Mercy growing, so I'm going to be that old man on the dance floor <laughs> with the two-year-old. Um, but come, and you don't have to dance. Dads, if that's weird for you, to get behind me. It's weird. So what we do, we play games, we can do musical chairs, we eat. It's not like two hours of sitting there dancing and feeling weird and awkward. So come. Everybody that I've talked to says, oh, I can't wait, I'm coming to that. And then I talk to Leanne, and she's got like four people who have registered. Yet 50 say they're coming. You got to go online and register because we need a head count for the food. We need to know how many chairs and tables are set up, okay? So if that's you and you've come, you say, oh, yeah, I'll be there. Go online. In fact, I don't even mind. You can pull out your phone right now and go to the Potter's Hand website and do it right now. I will not be offended. Please register for that because we've got to have the head count. It's coming up soon. And then don't forget the youth lock-in coming up. See Pastor Eric here if you want to know more about this. What we're going to do, we're going to Winter Jam this year, and instead of making the parents come back at midnight to pick you up, he has graciously put his life on the line and agreed to go into a lock-in that night. <laughs> so that's going to be awesome. It's like we're getting out of town, man. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> So please, sign up. If you see, have any questions, see him on that, okay? Lots of big things coming up. I can't even wait to tell you what we're doing for Easter. Woo! And that's coming up fast, too. Priscilla, you ready? Come on up here, and uh, after you tell us, I'll pray, and then we'll, we'll dive in. I'm